Um, and thank you everybody for attending tonight. My name is Di Robinson and I'm with the SES Community Engagement Unit and I'll be facilitating tonight's meeting. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the first people of the Murray River and the Mallee region as the traditional custodians of the land and waters on which we meet and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And we also honour the servicemen and women who sacrificed their lives in the defence of our freedom, peace and prosperity and also the pioneers who have guided and forged our communities. So welcome and, and really we do thank everybody for making the time out of your schedule to come out tonight. It's, it's fantastic, thank you. Uh, the SES and the reason that we're facilitating, we are the lead agency for flood and we've been working very closely with the community and other agencies and also our local council to manage the Murray River High Flows event. Tonight's meeting is an information session. We have speakers from the SES, the Department of Infrastructure and Transport, the uh, Department of Environment and Water, the Loxton Wakery Council, Primary Industries SA, Housing SA, and SA Water. And I'm hoping that a representative from SA Power Networks uh, um, will also turn up. Um, and all of these speakers are going to provide us with an update and they're going to let you know what they've been doing during this event. We have a range of brochures from the SES and I've also noticed that other agencies have got brochures out there. Please take as many as you like and take them for yourselves, um, friends, neighbours and anybody else. And, and also feel free to share any information that our speakers um, share with you tonight. Um, another thing, you will be hearing a lot of information tonight from speakers with, um, you know, websites and contact numbers and, and that sort of thing. We have now do have a single um, collated point of truth, which is sa.gov.au, and we actually have a brochure over there that gives you all the links. Um, but if you are on the internet, that is where you can go and it will link you to all the agencies and other things such as road closures and traffic restrictions and things like that. So I'd encourage you to, you may not need to scribble down all those numbers, they will all be on that website. Now the format um, for tonight is that we will have all our speakers talk first and then I'll open the floor for questions. So please, please hold all of your questions until then. And just a reminder, we will do our very best to, to answer all the questions, um, but we may not get to them all. And if that's the case and the time runs out, I've got some white paper over here and post-it notes. So if you have any questions that you do want to go to the agencies, please jot them down and stick them against the appropriate agency. And I'll make sure that they go to that agency. And the agencies have been updating both their frequently asked questions and also their social media to respond to queries that have been raised in um, community meetings so far. Um, and finally, I just would like to let you know that this session is being live streamed um, for those people that aren't able to attend in person tonight. So I would ask that our speakers hold the microphone close so that everybody, both here in the room and also live stream, can hear um, hear what you have to say. I would like to invite Craig Brassington up first and Craig is the SES Incident Controller um, and he'll start off our information session. Thanks. Uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for turning up tonight. Um, obviously as Di said there's a number of people out streaming this so thank you for that. There's a great thank you going to, out to the council uh, just not your own Wakery Council, Loxton Wakery. It's to all the councils right along. There's 10 councils involved at the moment, which are being involved with obviously the flood and things like that and being prepared for your community. Uh, a bit of an overview. You've all been told that it's about 165 gigalitres of water we're expecting a day. A bit of history on that. Presently, there's 102 coming into South Australia. We're expecting the peak to be around the 8th of December. So doing your calculations, we've got about three weeks before it gets to that level. So this is where we're really pushing in the way of you need to make a decision if you're going to stay or you're going to move. Because we're running out of time, every single day it's getting closer. 
the peak is going to rise quite quick, quickly. You know, at the moment, it's about 300, uh, 30 mil a day. It's going to rise quite quickly over the next few weeks. So we are really pushing for you to now make decisions down on the riverfront, things like that. So you either get everything in your properties up above and you're prepared to stay. And if you stay, we need to know about the housing side of things. If you leave, we'll try and, make, we'll try and protect your house the best as possible. Now, many of you got shacks along the area, and we know with normal shacks, you have a roller door at one end and a glass door or somewhere else or two roller doors. Lift the roller doors. Let the water come through, because you know if you get put pressure against your roller doors, they're just going to pop. So, again, make the decision. DW will tell you how much that height's going to be in three weeks' time. Unlike, and I know a lot of people turn around and say the 1974 flood and things like this, this flood is going to go on for months. So we're going to get to the peak of 165. We are then going to hold at about 150 for about a month or so. We don't expect it to go below 100, so where it is right now, to about March next year. So that's what you're basically saying. So February, March next year. So it's a lot of water coming through. So where you think you might have plans for Christmas and everything and be back in your houses, no. So this is why we're saying, be prepared, move out or stay. So I can't be more honest with you because, you know, it's your lives, sure it's property and everything else like that, but your life is more important. We can't guarantee we can put an SES or a CFS truck or any other emergency vehicle on the corner to get you out at any time. Because as I said, these rates will rise quickly. And where you think it might be one day and you come back the next day, it may be a long way up, a lot further. So make your decisions early. There is a number of, as Di said, if you go to the sa.gov.au website, that'll give you the information that you require. And that's what we're really pushing for. Obviously, there's a vulnerable persons list we can put you on. We know some people may not be able to move. So again, this will come back to housing, so your name gets put, put down on there, and we make that sort of contact with you to make sure. Some people might be getting isolated. Again, we're putting plans in to solve those sorts of issues too. But we're trying to warn you as much as possible and give you as much information. It's unlike fires, it's unlike flash flooding and everything else. This is just building up constantly every day. It's not stopping. So as I said, we got to about the 8th of December for you to make the decision to be gone or stay. Um, that was bad news, wasn't it? Uh, so what we're wanting to do from there. So we've got a lot of committees in the background happening to try and protect a lot of, lot of uh, significant businesses, uh, infrastructure, things like that. So these are being worked on, obviously, behind the scenes and some work is probably getting done down here with the council. They may be putting levy banks in or things like that or raising them with the levy banks. If you do it yourself and it's not structurally done correctly, it's more likely going to impact more onto your property because obviously with that quantity of water against that levy over the amount of time, it's more likely going to fail and you'll have a greater rush going through your property. So don't think that just by pushing up some loads of sand or dirt or anything else, that's going to solve the problem. You have to have them engineer correctly to use the right materials if you've put levies up or anything else like that. If they don't have a certificate basically of an engineer, you know, you're basically in the laps of the gods. That's what it comes down to. Um, anything else? So try and work on your flood plan. So if you're actually thinking about staying in your property, think about what you need, because there's a good possibility the power's going to be turned off. How are you going to use your septic and things like that? So all these little things you've got to keep in the back of your mind. If you can run on generator, and that, that's up to you. But also think about certain things that if the power goes off, how are you going to keep going for the next couple of months? Because that'll be up to SA Power Networks to work out when they switch the power. All right, so that's basically where I want to leave it. You know, 
I'm almost like the Grinch of Christmas, aren't I, for you? <laughs> so, um, I'm happy to answer questions at the end of the, end of the night, so please come up and see me, and we'll take it from there. Okay? Thanks for that good news, Grinch. I mean, Craig. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can I invite... I'd like to have invite Chrissy um, Bloss up next, and Chrissy's from the Department of Environment and Water. Thank you. Um, so my role in the Department for Environment and Water, the manager of River Murray Water Delivery. So my day job is about delivering water from upstream states through to South Australia and managing weir pools and salinity and the like. And now we're getting into flood area and my background has been in flood management and I'm a hydrologist originally before that. I want to talk to you a bit about the flows and understanding them and also the information we have available to help you understand what your flood risk might be. So as mentioned earlier, at the moment, the flow over the border is 102 gig a day. Over lock one, it's about 78. Bit of, it decreases a bit on the way down, also a bit of a time lag. Uh, South Australia is fairly unique in that we always tend to refer to the flow in the river um, by the, the flow at the border. Uh, that's largely because we don't have some major tributaries coming into the river uh, as, as it comes down. Now, while we keep referring to the flow at the border, uh, we do have tables available within the resources uh, which can be accessed by that sa.gov.au website, specifically within the Department for Environment and Water Products. We've got a table that relates each of those flow rates to water levels at common gauging stations on the river, uh, including Wakery. Uh, so, so, for example, um, the uh, peak uh, that we are... Uh, is the current forecast, we're talking about... 165 gig a day, possibly up to 200, maybe 220 if worse things happen. Um, so 165 gig a day for context. The 1974 flood was 182 at the border. The 1975 flood was 162. So we're looking at that kind of flood similar to those previous floods that happened in the 70s, but there is a chance they could be larger. So in 1975, the, the water level at Wakery uh, was... 11.17, so go back a step, uh, pool level uh, at, uh, at Wakery, your upstream of Lock 2, about 6.1. So the 1970s, the water level rose about five metres above normal pool level. Um, if we, say, get to 200 gig a day, we could be as much as five and a half metres above the normal water level. Um, we do have flood mapping available on the website that has mapped the extent for each of these flow rates. And, and they're a useful tool for seeing where the water might go. They're not perfect, they're a modelled product and each flood is different, how it can uh, change as it comes down. Also, um, the events that they've been calibrated against, so like 1970s, even 1950s floods, things change. Also, um, the, the location of levees and things have changed. So these flood maps assume that no one's gone out there and built something in the two weeks prior to the flood. So, so have a look at those flood maps. That they're useful for contextual information to give you an idea of what your risk might be, but they're never going to be perfect in every regard because there's a number of assumptions in them. And certainly if you're making some big decisions around, uh, for example, uh, raising electrical equipment or things like that, would encourage you to, to take an extra level of dive of information and comparing some water levels to surveyed heights and that kind of thing. But, but they're a good start. I want to talk a bit more about uh, the forecast. I know that it has created a bit of uncertainty in the community, the fact that we've increased the forecast a few times over the last few weeks. Now, we're not happy about doing that, and obviously having a range of uncertainty is not ideal, but we've been committed to providing the best available information to the community, despite that uncertainty, because every week that you have to prepare is critical. There may be future updates that forecast. We can't guarantee that won't. We, we know there'll be even more rainfall in, in the catchment over the past week. Uh, but at the moment, um, the range we have is that 165 to 200, maybe slightly higher. Uh, the rainfall over the recent week, we saw a lot of rainfall uh, in the Lachlan catchment, upstream of the Hume Dam, some very large releases there. The impact that it's going to have on the forecast, we think, probably not going to increase that peak that we're looking at at the start of December but it may extend the duration of that even more. And as Craig mentioned, we are looking at a kind of flood that's going to hang around for months. It's going to be over 100 gig a day for probably three months. 
it could be over 150 gig a day for a month or more. So it is going to be quite a challenging event compared to say some of the previous floods that come, come through where there'll be water sitting around on the floodplain for ages causing discomfort, or sorry, uh, inconvenience uh, and, uh, and a whole heap of other issues that come with it by having a, a floodplain full of water. Um, like I said, we've, we have a number of tools to assist you understanding what those impacts can be. We have, uh, we'll have water level predictions provided regularly on, on our products on the internet. You access via that sa.gov.au website. Uh, we will update that um, as new information comes through. We have the flood mapping products to see if your property could be at risk, noting that some, then obviously there's some uncertainty around those, but they're a useful first pass tool. Um, we, um, oh, sorry. Yes, so, um, so there we do um, want to keep an update on that information as the information Im improves. So uh, at the moment, say upstream, uh, there is a level of uncertainty through, uh, for example, the big releases from the Hume Dam, how that's going to travel through. Um, we saw some fairly horrific. Uh, pictures from the last two days of big big flows in the Lachlan River. We're fairly confident that in that system, particularly the really large wetland at the bottom, that they tend to it just mitigates, it, it attenuates a lot as it comes down and just sort of dribbles down the bottom. It shouldn't make a big difference to flow to South Australia, but there are large flows coming in the Darling system as well. So we will continue to provide updates as we get better confidence in what those flow, flow forecasts will be, um, and we just encourage people to look at the range of forecasts that we're providing and, and uh, um, you know, we have at the bottom one, we have quite a fair amount of confidence, we're definitely going to get to that flow, but think ahead to that upper range of well, what other things would I need to do if we did get to 200 or 220, just in case, because for us, um, there are still things that could change in the coming weeks that mean that the forecast could get higher. Obviously, as it comes closer, that that confidence improves, but it's a natural system and it's a very, very challenging uh, situ uh, complex river system with multiple tributaries coming in. It is really, really challenging uh, to forecast flows reliably at the point in the catchment where they are now. Um, and I'm happy to um, uh, answer any questions later on about those, those flood mapping products uh, and about um, level information or any other information that, that would assist you um, in, in helping to to manage the risk yourself. Thank you. Thanks, Chrissy. Um, next, I'd like to ask David Beaton, the CEO of the Loxton Wagery Council. Thank you, and thank you for being here tonight. Um, I suppose I just want to talk about what the, the council's doing. So with the predicted floods and now the um, continued rain that we've had and the changes that have happened in the predictions, we're basing our defensive strategy on a flow of 250 gigalitres a day. All right? So we're building and reacting to those sort of levels so that what we put in place now, hopefully if it, things do go to different scenarios, that, we'll be, that the community will be safe. <coughs> so the main issues that we've got, and I'll just talk about... Um, mainly about Wakery. Um, so the, one of the main issues that we've got in, in Wakery is the houseboat moorings. So um, councils had uh, engineers come and have a look and people that uh, specialise in the flows. So we're getting in uh, steel pylons that are nine metres long, so they'll be four metres into the ground and five metres into the ground and four metres out. To, um, to give enough strength, and there'll be three three places that that a houseboat can moor onto. So there'll be like a diamond shape up the top. So there'll be one that it can push up against there, and two on each side. Sorry, two on each side for for each one. So we're hoping that that will be um, enough, and we can get them together close enough. Because I was talking to the hydrologist today, and probably the worst place in the council area to have a houseboat moorings when you've got this type of flood is right where we've got them. <laughs> because the river wants to push the water to um, Hart Lagoon. All right, so that's the natural flow. 
and it's an acceleration point. So um, the, the, the other houseboat moorings in the council area, we're, we're lifting up and we're putting in similar pylons, but only a couple of metres out of the ground. So the, the main issue is here, and the council's probably looking at spending on the houseboat moorings across the council area in excess of $200,000 to understand the, the nature and the, and the problem. Um, in Wakery, we're also looking at, in partnership with the Ed Roots Group, about extending the, the levee that goes around the caravan park and a bit further along towards the, um, the Lions playground, because there's a high point there, um, to try and increase that by a couple of metres. Hopefully, that will give the um, Edwards Group either enough chance to move their cabins or they may want to try at a later date to increase the height of that themselves if they haven't got the ability to move the cabins. The biggest issue, so there, there's a couple of downers, but the biggest issue we've actually got in Wakery is stormwater. All right? Because of the stormwater you know, rush, rushes down and the pipes go into the river, all right, the, the big pipes that we've got will not be able to dis displace the water well enough. So it's because of the slope and the hydraulic pressure has the potential to affect all the pipes up through the town and potentially blow some of them out. So you, you'll, you'll notice that we've got people doing work down in the corner near the old effluent ponds. So what we're trying to do there is dig and, and create a, a dam, all right, so, but away from the river so that we can put the stormwater into there, let the pipes take the stormwater and put them into there and then pump that water over top of the dam wall into the river to try and protect the town. So additionally, um, next to the Lifestyle Village, you'll notice that we're digging a couple of big uh, trenches. They're, they're detention dams. So what that is is to take some of the edge off the water as it comes down. Um, they won't have a great capacity, but what they'll do is give more time and the way that we can move the water away and protect the, the, the town infrastructure. So at, at 250 gigalitres, we think you know, the Ranco Road is right pretty much most of the way. There's probably a, a low spot as you um, head past the retirement village, but the rest of it looks, on the levels that we've got, looks pretty good. So they're the things that we're putting in place. Um, is anybody from Kingston on Murray here? Yep, all right. So, all right, I'll keep going there. So, um, Kingston on Murray, so we've got a similar problem with the houseboat mooring, so we're going to move the houseboats further along and we're going to lift the levee bank, there's work undertaken there now, lift the levee bank by about a metre and a half so that we're once again looking at that 250 gigalitre protection. Um, for Marook, the um, information that we have and we're trying to make sure that that's correct is that the levy banks that we've currently got will um, be safe to the 250 gigalitres. So there's a, we've had some engineers go around and look at them all. There's a couple of spots within them that need to be repaired but in general they're in pretty good condition and the road will hold back any other water that uh, would go over into the, into the township. Um, Anybody, any other areas that I, that I haven't covered that someone's come from information? Look, it's a really difficult time. I went to the um, one we had at um, Blanchetown last week and caught up with the people from Paisley. Paisley has a lot of shacks and things like that. The whole township will go under, do you know what I mean? So that's, that's devastating. I talk, spoke to the lady from the caravan park. She's got a disabled son, gets fed with a peg. So they've got to find somewhere that they can have a cabin that's got some electricity. They've got to make sure that it's not going to be electricity that's going to be switched off by the by SA Power Network. So there's all those community things that are really hard. One of one of the things, hopefully we we get all the planning right now. But the big the big issue for the community as we work together will be the recovery, the recovery after inundation for this long. You know we've spent millions on the on the riverfront here 
and we've got to get it back because of you know the people that were coming to to see it and what it was doing for the town we've got to get all that back and we've got to work together to make sure that we get you know wakery and and the areas back up to their pristine condition again so the recovery will take us a long time but we know what it what it can be and what it can look like and we, we look forward to working with you to get that done thank you Thank you for that update, David. There was a lot of information there. Um, next, next, I would like to invite Donna Gray up to the mic. Um, and Donna's from the Department of Infrastructure and Transport. Hi, everybody. My name's Donna Gray. I'm the maintenance engineer lead for Zone 2, which encompasses all of the Murray River. Um, I'm based out of Murray Bridge, so I do have a bit of a regional background as well. I'm filling in for our stakeholder officer who's um, been unwell. She's actually feeling a little better, but thought it would be best for me to come tonight and speak to you all. So I just wanted to um, start by going through um, you know, the data that we've been gathering, the planning, the same as all the other agencies, using all the modelling that's supplied and available to all of you as well. Um, we, our aim is to keep the environment safe for all of the community, um, particularly with the ferries. As the river rises, um, it will affect most of the ferries at some point. Um, the main one, obviously, for this particular group will be Wakery. So at the moment, it's on the lower landing. Um, we have prepared the higher landing and currently at the moment the water level is sitting at 1.1. To commission from the lower level to the higher level um, it needs to be at 1.6. So the marine team are constantly monitoring that. When it gets to the position where it can be shifted um, it could take maybe two to three days that the ferry won't be available and we will be starting off with light loads, so a single lane on the ferry and predominantly just your standard normal um, vehicle, car um, that you would have for your family. Once it reaches two metres, that's when we can start considering going back to normal operations. To help manage that, there's going to be an echo sounder on the ferry which will help assess the loading and help us to understand how to um, get people from one side of the river to the other safely. There are other ferries that will go out, as I said, Morgan, Lirup, Manham, Swan Reach, Walker Flat and Penong. And again, they'll be monitoring the levels at each of those locations to make sure that they can keep them open as long as we practically can. And then once the water does start to recede um, and they have been closed, when we can open them again. We've been working on all the detours, um, which for some people, depending on where you're trying to get to within that river system, Mid-Murray, Riverland and the Lower Lakes, it will depend on where you're trying to go as to how much further that detour route will take you. I believe that the detour maps, if they're not up on our website today, they should be up there by tomorrow. And there was a media release um, put out today as well for everybody to have a look and get an understanding of where we're going. So those main areas are Book Penong Road, which is between the Loxton and the Berry, and then also here in Wakery with the ferry and the delay that that's going to cause. Where am I up to? So just the touching on the detours, um, we, we will have 42 variable message boards out on the network to try and give people as much notice as possible when each of the road closures are enacted and when the ferries are closed. Hopefully that will assist people to decide the best route for them to get to where they're going. And we also have additional maintenance teams that we're putting together to help with the additional traffic loading on those roads. And we're out there in the next three weeks trying to do as much as we can um, on the road network to accommodate the additional traffic on the detours. 
We will also have updates on Traffic SA. So as each of those ferries or road closures come into play, uh, they will be available for people to look um, and try and establish where they're going with those detours. And then in relation to the marine area of the department, uh, the guys have been out there trying to put the yellow buoys on all of the hazards within the water. They are aware, though, that there will be some hazards that they haven't identified or that they're not aware of. And if you do know of any, please contact us and we will do our best to identify those and make them safe um, so that they can be seen by all users of the river. When on the river, please wear a life jacket. The flows are going to be higher than everybody's expecting and most people I do know already wear a life jacket when they go in the river, um, but this is going to be really, really important to do that. Where am I up to? The last thing I've got is um, when the roads do close, so at this stage it's Book Penong Road, Kingston Road is likely, we'll work with the councils for some of the council roads that sort of link in with our um, department state roads. If there is water over the road, please don't drive through it. It's really not worth your life to get caught in that water. And there may even be some roads that are closed before the water is actually over the road. So I just wanted to make that point because people can see that the roads still available to be driving on, but we may actually have it closed. Um, we will allow emergency services um, as long as we can before we actually have to make a hard road closure. So that will help the community with fire, ambulance, police, up until the last minute. I'll be hanging around if anybody has any specific questions. So um, yeah, just come and see me. Thank you. Big thanks for that, Donna. That's um, a heap of information there as well. Um, next up, I'd like to invite Barb Cowie from Primary Industries of SA. Howdy. Um, it's pretty daunting looking out, by the way, just so that you all know. Um, most of you would know that I work for Primary Industries and Regions in the Regions section as the Regional Coordinator for Riverland and Murray Lands and live just across the river, so fully aware of what's going on and how things are impacting uh, locally. PERSA also has done the modelling um, as everybody else and we've done our inundation maps and uh, while we do have some ground that will have fruit trees that will or vines that will go over, predominantly the inundation will be annuals for this region, annual cropping or um, some pastures. However, we are still ground truthing maps, so um, if you do know of land that, that might be outside of, of that, let us know. Like I found out there were some buffaloes the other night down at Mapalonga, so we don't know everything. Um, yeah, crazy. Um, what we do know is that uh, pumps and power are going to be a significant issue. And I just want to put it on the table, and I'm not going to take anything like from SA Power Networks, but um, we are working on trying to actually get a good picture of what this might look like, because the last thing we want is pumps to be high, power to be high, but, but the power going through a low point and it being cut off and no one being prepared. Now, we know most, pe most irrigators um, have adapted their pumping to meet high-level um, water uh, high, high water. However, we, we're not 100% of what that's sure what that looks like for uh, power and access. So if you know of any unique situations, please let me know. Find me, ring me, do whatever, uh, because I am putting together um, some areas that are probably more problematic than others. So, um, you know, there are going to be some. We do know, and I have been talking to CIT and RIT, and we do know that their main pump stations are all OK at this point in time, and they've been working with SA Power Networks to make sure of that. So the, it's predominantly once it leaves CIT or private irrigators, obviously, that, that we're looking at. Um, transport's going to be a significant issue, and once again, uh, for us, it's about just reminding people that 
we know crops need to get off and um, we know that there's going to be some long journeys to get them where they need to go. And um, on top of that, if you're on the Goida Highway, remember that we've also got the interconnector transport as well. So it is just going to be super busy and already some significant potholes appearing every day. So just please be careful. Um, in this response, PERSA has responsibility for livestock and animals. So if there are any stranded animals or you hear or see anything, uh, please let us know. We have a relationship with RSPCA and Animal Welfare League and we will get them um, engaged very quickly. Um, and so please, once again, let me know that. Uh, Favourite topic, fruit fly. Uh, we are still in 16... We still have 16 outbreak areas in the Riverland that we will be continuing to work with as we are now. Um, I'm not part of the fruit fly response team uh, directly, but what I do know is that uh, we are looking for locations on uh, this side of the, uh, on the Wakery side of the river, that upriver, so that transport and access can be um, mitigated because um, currently most of the operation is based out of Loxton and that is going to be problematic. So um, we are looking at shifting uh, at least the, the um, on-ground teams so that they can actually still work in a timely manner. Once again, they're going to have exactly the same issues as everybody else. They're going to have access issues, they're going to have transport issues and um, it will, we, we will be doing the best we can to make sure that, that that continues in a seamless way. But once again, if you're finding anything or you're seeing anything, please give me a call and I will follow it up. Um, on top of fruit fly, we're also monitoring varroa and foot and mouth. And obviously, with a lot of mosquitoes around, there's going to be Japanese encephalitis. And I would encourage everyone in the room to go and get your free Japanese encephalitis uh, vaccination. It's a one-off. You only have to do it once. It's not like COVID vax. You just go in. And it is free for everybody who lives on the river. So um, if you... And there is two types. So if you are immune compromised, there is a second type. So please uh, check it out. Um, Black water. I've got all the fun too. I don't know. This is pretty crap, really. Um, black water is actually the responsibility of DW. However, the management of the dead fish is the responsibility of primary industries. Um, so we um, have already put in place a management plan for when that happens. Uh, we're pretty confident that there will be some black water events at some time. We're hoping that they're not going to be too bad, but we are ready for any major fish kills that might happen. And obviously, there'll be a lot of work done in to try and um, mitigate that as it, before it happens. Um, finally, I just want to remind everybody that we have our farm and business mentors, um, and we have three of them in the Riverland, uh, Brent Fletcher, uh, John Chase, and, and Robin Kane, who most of you in the room would know. Please give any of them a call if you would like to just have a chat. And it could be about the challenges you're about to face or it could be just about where to go or just that you want to have a chat. They are there. We're, not going, we're encouraging everybody to use them and um, it would be really fantastic if they, they did because they are there for us. Uh, uh, they are a point of contact. And um, just another really bad thing to finish on because that's what tonight's about, I think. Um, I was really sad that Wakery didn't get Ag Town of the Year. Sorry, guys, but my Polonga got it. Thanks very much for that, Barb. And um, thanks for all the bad news. Um, next up from the Department of Housing SA, Tony. Um, Tony Davis, hopefully you've got some good news for us, Tony. I don't have any bad news. Uh, so my name's Tony Davis, I work at Housing SA and uh, I'm part of the Emergency Relief Unit. Um, I've been asked tonight to speak to you with regards to a relief centre and what that looks like and what that means. So the relief centre is open up when uh, Housing SA is tasked by the State Emergency Centre. It's uh, initially a safe haven for the community and of course the staff that uh, are asked to man it. We have uh, many different um, agencies coming to assist us from uh, the state government, not necessarily just a Housing SA staff. 
Um, how do we select these uh, sites? Well, we have over 300 pre-identified sites already um, identified uh, for over the last few years. Um, the Relief Centre is also supported by our participating agencies. Uh, initially, you'll find uh, people from Red Cross and Disaster Recovery Ministries there, and also Lions. And Lions cook up a good, uh, a good breakfast and a good lunch and a definitely a good dinner as well. So you would uh, be greeted with uh, a meal there. So the idea is when you do come into the Relief Centre, we, t we turn on, on the, the lights, you get a cup of tea, you get to gather your thoughts, and we're going to have people around to talk to you about whatever it is that you would like to talk about at that particular time. As the uh, event uh, progresses, we um, then engage other agencies. For example, you may see Centrelink come in, you may see Rotary come in, uh, or St Vincent de Paul's. Uh, as the event progresses further, uh, it, when it's warranted, we would make an application, well, the state manager would to the minister, requesting um, uh, grants and accommodation grants be uh, looked at. At the moment, we're based at the IMT in Loxton, and we've been trying to source adequate accommodation. Those resources are very, very thin. So I'd encourage you now to look at what your options would be for, as Craig said earlier this evening, three weeks' time, what it is that you're going to do because we've had a look around, we've done lots of research and uh, things are very thin in terms of accommodation availability. The personal hardship grant is not a life-changing grant. I'm happy to discuss the... Um, uh, the facts and figures of that a little bit later on um, after the session if you'd like to know some more about it. However, it's actually money that will be issued to you for the very immediate effect. So, for example, if you had to evacuate at a, a particular time of the evening and you perhaps were in, in bed at that time and you got into your car and you didn't pack any clothes, obviously you wouldn't, uh, food, fuel, etc., that's the type of money that uh, we, we can offer you. So the maximum grant, if you're eligible, is $700 for a family. Okay, we um, are also busy at this point in time trying to um, work out how many relief centres we would need to have opened up and exactly where we're going to put our staff so that we can help you as well should that actually evolve. And once again, sa.gov.au, on there we will have our um, list of our re relief centres uh, when they're opening up, the, the times um, that you can come in. Initially, it uh, can be anything up to 24-7 until things settle down. Um, but you'll find all the uh, grant information on there as well. Uh, so please refer to that website if there's uh, any questions uh, after t tonight's uh, session, please don't uh, hesitate to come and see me. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. And as Tony said, that $700 isn't very much at all. So again, we would encourage you, um, this is about being prepared as well. So have your emergency kit ready with your important papers and a spare pair of undies so that you'll have something at least. Um, next up, I'd like to invite Paul Irwin from SA Power Network. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Paul Irwin from SA Power Networks. Um, and I'd just like to say from the outset, it's our absolute desire to keep the lights on and the power flowing for as many of you as we, we possibly can. And that's what we're aiming on, on doing. Um, you may have seen in the recent couple of weeks, we've had a helicopter up and around, uh, up and down the river. Um, looking at lower lying areas and where areas that, that need attention potentially for uh, disconnection. We've got a few boats that we use uh, as well in conjunction with uh, SA Water and we've had people on the ground looking at these areas that we know will potentially need attention. Like everybody else, we are modelling 
on the inflows that were being advised all the way up to that 250 gigalitre level as well. So we're following what everybody else is, is looking at and, and doing. We're going to try and provide as much advance notice as possible if disconnection does take place and we primarily do that through an SMS service. I've got a number of these flyers on the, on the desk over here and I encourage you to pick one of those up. It'll show you how to apply for that SMS service. There's a, a QR code for people that know how to use that. You pretty much just open up the camera on your phone and scan that code and it'll take you to our website. Um, that's great if you're familiar with electronic products. If you're like me and you'd rather just call somebody and get them to do it for you, you can just call us on 13 12 61. That number is at the bottom of this flyer as well. You can call us about anything in relation to this flood for information you're looking for on that, on that number as well. So we may need to um, look at disconnections in some areas. We already have had to disconnect some low-lying areas where shacks have been inundated with water. Uh, we do that for your safety. We try and get in to do it before the flood levels arise because we want to isolate and impact the least amount of people as possible. So we do that by changing, make, uh, we've made some changes to our infrastructure on the fly. So we cut into a certain point to isolate the least amount of people that we possibly can do. As roads close or as tracks become restricted, that means we've got to take off supply further up stream on our infrastructure. We want to try and avoid doing that as much as possible. If you're a business and you're looking, as some of the previous speakers have talked about and Bob's talked about, raising your switchboard, raising um, your, your own installation above the waterline, um, then we urge you to get an electrical contractor out to start looking at that, doing that now not waiting for three weeks' time, but doing it right now if you aren't already looking at it. Ask them to include River Murray Flood in their comments. When they put that in their comments on the job, we'll expedite your, your job to make sure that we can do that work for you before floods arrive. We've got a lot of our personnel in this area, a lot of personnel that have redirected to this area to complete those works for you before, before this water arrives. But you've got to act now. The SMSs will be our primary method of communicating with people or call us, we'll be able to tell you. But as floodwaters do eventually recede, we'd be looking to communicate with you via SMS to say, we're able to reconnect this area if we've had to disconnect it. So power's gonna be on when you need to, to go back to that area. Um, for those areas that we do need to disconnect, we'll be we'll sending you an SMS every week anyway, just to say, look, it's still off. We know the water level is still too high. If we still can't get in, you might get sick of those texts if it goes on for a while, but we think you'd rather know when things are coming back on. When we do restore supply, it'll be the day that we restore supply, we'll be sending information to you to say, look, it's back on. If it's safe to go back into that area, you can go back in and, and look at whatever damage uh, has happened. Um, we'd suggest to you, and it probably goes without saying, but I'll, I'll mention it anywhere, if you've got any electrical appliances that are going to be impacted by flood, we encourage everybody to lift them as high as they can or remove them from the property. Um, we also encourage you, if your property is going to be impacted, to turn off the main electrical switch at your switchboard. And if you've got solar panels, get a qualified electrician to help you to look at isolating those or isolate them at the switches that are already there. You've paid a lot of money to put your solar panels up. So the best thing you can do is actually turn them off. Don't leave your property with those panels on because you'll find it may end up damaging your system. If you want to have somebody remove your uh, inverter that you've got on your wall, it's a good idea to look at having that done if you think the floodwaters are, are going to impact that. If you've got a battery, um, I don't know how many of you might have that, but lithium ion batteries and water don't mix. Uh, there's a real chance that that will explode. Uh, and if you've spent the thousands of dollars that it costs for a battery, you don't want to have that happen and not be able to recover. So we're encouraging people, if you do have a battery, get your installer to come out and actually remove it and, and put it somewhere safe so that you can reinstall it later. Um, when it comes to flooding um, and you come back to your property uh, and the supply is back on, if you feel any tingling in taps, 
be it in your sink or in your bathroom, you need to call us straight away. We need to come out and see what sort of impact there's been at your property. That, that's the same said without a flood. If you're feeling tingling in your taps now anyway, you've got a problem at your, at your property. So if that happens even now and you don't get impacted, call us straight away. We need to come out and assess if you need to get a private electrician in or if it's something that we can fix for you. If you're travelling by boat in floodwaters, we just urge you don't touch or raise any power lines that you find or see. We encourage you not to travel under power lines at all, especially as waters rise. The infrastructure around you in the town is at a level for a specific reason, and that's to avoid shock to people. It's buried either 600 mil or deeper underground, or it sits at the four metres, four and a half metres that it exists for a reason. When waters flood, that gap lessens, so the chance of electric shock becomes real, which is why we look in some places in lower lying areas where the flood waters will impact at disconnecting. It's about keeping people safe. We don't want to see a death occur um, or somebody get significantly impacted through that shock. It's not a responsible thing that our business is, is looking to see happen to anybody. If you see electrical poles or a substation underwater, fallen power lines, any objects in contact with those power lines that are actually in water or poles and wires that are covered in water, we urge you to stay at least 150 metres away. I know a lot of our advertising says if you see a power line down, you know, keep 10 metres away, but this stuff in water, keep 150 metres away and please call us about it. So 150 minute length of the local football field from goal line to goal line, you need to steer clear by, by that much and call us. There'll be information on our website, on the, the outage map that we have on our website that will show you areas that have, have been disconnected. It's not a perfect tool, but it'll give you an idea. The best thing for you is the SMS updates, which we just urge you to um, have a look at. Uh, myself, I'll be sticking around at the end. My compatriot stand, sitting by the door, Cam Daniel, will be here. If you've got any questions that you want to ask us or talk to us about the information that we've just given, because I know there's a lot of information tonight, we'll be happy to, to speak to you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'd now uh, like to ask Chris Young to the mic. Um, and Chris is from SA Water. Thank you, Di. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Chris Young, and I'm the Operations Manager for, for SA Water. Uh, I'm going to quickly close us out to question time, so I'll briefly go through uh, the, uh, the current situation here in Wakery. So you've already heard uh, ourselves, too, we are doing modelling up to 250 uh, 50 gigalitres. Uh, I'm going to cover off three areas, which is drinking water services, wastewater services, and uh, River Murray operations, which is in particular in, in respect to, uh, to our locks and weirs. So first off, in terms of uh, water quality uh, and water quality and water supply, there are currently no impacts there. Uh, we have a really good understanding uh, of, the, of the assets that will be impacted. Uh, and, it, and it's fair to say that the treatment plant here in Wakery, which is on Cliff Street, is well above the anticipated inflows into the state. Uh, one area that we are concerned about, and we've heard about black water, uh, is, is our plants are, are, are really well designed to be able to deal with a black water event. However, there are occasions where compounds from a black water event can pass through a water treatment facility. That does not compromise the actual safety of the water supply, but it does leave an earthy taste or odour uh, in that water supply. So there's nothing to be concerned about other than the taste and all the odour aspects of that. Uh, we, we are confident that none of the treatment plants will be inundated. Uh, so, but we are working with our suppliers in terms of the product that's used through the, uh, the treatment water process. Uh, if there are any impacts to our wastewater supply, uh, our water supply, we will reach out to you in the traditional methods, uh, but we'd also do it through social media, media as well. In terms of the wastewater services here in Wakery, that is provided by the council. Uh, so any questions in relation to your wastewater services or your septic tanks services, please reach out to the council. Uh, but as always, in the times of need, we'll be, we'll be ready to able to assist the council should we need to. Okay. Uh, in relation to the River Murray structures and the operations of the locks and weirs uh, above here, uh, we operate those under the direction of the MDBA or, or due. Uh, at the moment, all those structures have been removed. Uh, there's, there's enough clearance there to be able to navigate up the river uh, without those structures in place. Okay. 
I'll be around uh, until the end as well for any questions in relation to SA water aspects. Okay. Thank you, Chris, and thank you to all our speakers. Um, that brings the first part of our meeting to a close. Um, as well as the speakers that we have here, we also have Scott Denny from SAPOL. We have Greg Perry, the Director of Infrastructure from the Loxton Wakery Council. Andrew McKinnon from SA Tourism. Um, Francis Asher from Destination Riverland. And we have Gary from SA Ambulance who are also um, in the audience and they're available to respond to any questions that you may have. <coughs> We only have the one microphone, so I will ask that you stand up when you ask your question and speak clearly so um, both our panel and um, people that are going to respond to the questions and also those that are um, at home live streaming are able to hear your question. And it will be a little bit of a running game for me to get the microphone to you and then bring it back to our um, speakers. Um, I would also ask that you limit limit your questions to one question per person so that we can um, answer as many as we can. And I'd also ask that you do keep the question flood related. I know we have a wonderful crowd of people here that you may have many questions for, but um, I really encourage, well, I do ask you to keep that um, flood related. And again, if we do not get time to answer your question, please put it on a post-it note and put it onto the paper. Okay. I will now open the floor to questions if... Okay, bingo. As a resident of the Lifestyle Village down on... just this side of the caravan park, how are we looking for the future, please? If we are concerned. I mean, I'm in a recent addition to Wakery residents, so... Who, who would like to take that question? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, as I was saying, saying before, we're uh, forecasting to 250, our uh, planning, and the road that's in front of there is, will stop the, the water at that level, but there, there is a potential for um, seepage to come through, so we're talking to the Edwards group about that and what yeah, might need to... Sorry? <laughs> Sorry? Um, yeah, so... There is the uh, potential more for seepage um, into that area, so uh, as into the caravan park as well. So we're talking to the Edwards group and we're, we're looking to have some pumps around the, the town so that see if seepage becomes a problem that we can get it away from the, from the properties and into the flow of the river. <laughs> so does that mean it's going to go under? No, so what, what I said before was the road, we're, we're, pl we've, we're planning to 250 and, and the road will protect those properties at 250, right? Now, what the extra bit I was saying was there is the potential for when the water's up so high that you might have groundwater lift, right? So that's what I was talking about with seepage and you need to be able to move that away from the properties and we've been talking to the Edwards group about that. Thank you. And, and as everybody's aware, this is a very dynamic situation. And if we had a crystal ball, we certainly would tell you if your property was going to go under or not. Okay. I don't know who this question's for, but I live at what was originally Wapunda. You know Wapunda? Then changed to Wigley Flood. We live down on the river. Are we going to get water over the top of us again like 56? We have um, an escape plan. We've got all that in order. I'm just wondering if you can give me any clarity on that one. Thank you. Uh, well, just with the modelling right now, where the water is right at the stage, we're expecting probably another metre and a half to come up. So that's what you can pretty well work on right at this stage. So that's the minimum that's going to come up to your properties. If you're down on that, it's a metre and a half. So... Yeah, look, if you want to catch up with me later, we can have a look at the modelling and pick out your property and and see what it does at the different levels to see see when you're going to be affected. Oh, that's terrific. The preparedness, that's fantastic. Yes, gentlemen. 
Uh, lifestyle Village again, uh, sewerage. I was reading today the um, guidance uh, the council has on uh, septic systems, uh, not to pump out at this stage, uh, but with a, uh, a, f a level, a height of the river uh, lasting six, four, four to six weeks, um, the, the likelihood of having an overflow um, or groundwater around it is going to restrict us um, are you in charge of the Edwards Group uh, for safety from sewerage? Dave, uh, David. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. The um, not the whether I'm in charge of the Edwards Group, but the about the what what we'll do is if we think there's going to be inundation that's going to affect you, we we will notify people beforehand and give them advice about what they'd need to do for, with their septics if it looks like that's going to happen. But if we're getting this rising water from coming up from the ground, yeah. it means the sewage system won't be out of function. Well, it, it, so yeah, like there's, 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 yeah, so there's, there's a possibility, not a certainty, about the seepage, and that's what I'm saying. We're planning <laughs> to be able to do something. doesn't mean it's necessarily absolutely going to happen. So will you declare the place unlivable if it gets worse? Well, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll give the the turd expert here the the, um, the chance. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so, so we've got a swim system. So basically, we haven't got a soakage trench. So your it goes into your septic, and then all the water actually goes into a pipe system, and it goes to a big tank straight straight behind the village, and it gets pumped right out to Sunlands. So. The only way that you're going to be impacted or anyone's going to be impacted with their swim system or their septics or toilets is if the seepage, which was sort of explained before, rises and pulls and actually starts flowing into your septic system. Thank you for that. I hope that was a great question. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Oh, just a moment. With Donna, how come we can only have five cars going onto the ferry at one stage? It takes ten. We've been there, done it before, so what's the difference of it? So I hope I can answer your question, but the information that I've been given by our marine team I just wanted to clarify something first. Do you mean there's only five going on there at the moment or when I mean it goes to the higher landing and we've got that short period with low water? So from my understanding, um, that's one of the reasons they've got that echo sounder. It helps monitor where the underground um, levels are, but it also is because of the flow itself. So the drag... Um, on the ferry and the instability um, when they don't have enough water below the bottom of the ferry. So when they, that's why when they reach that two metre, um, two metres of water, that's when they can go back to normal um, operations. Does, does that answer your question? All I can do is go back and ask that question because I must admit I wasn't in the department back then and I'm not part of the marine team. So oh, yeah. Yeah. I can ask, the, I can certainly ask the question. That's not a problem at all. Thanks, Donna. And um, hopefully you'll be able to put that in the frequently <laughs> asked questions. So we'll get that information out. Thank you for that. Uh, question? I'm Lifestyle Village. No, not everybody is on the internet. I'm not. So what do we do? Thank you. Who would like to take that one? Yeah, look, um, come to the council office. It's open seven days a week. Um, so if you want to get some um, additional information or want to know what, you know, come in a couple of times a week. 
if you need to, um, just to get up-to-date information. We do put it on the social media, and I, I understand what you're saying about not having social media, so just feel to free to come and see us, and we'll pass on that information any time you like. Thank you. And, um, and if you've got a phone, um, we'd encourage you to register for updates, and they'll come directly to your phone. Um, I was just wondering, where do we get sandbags from and the sand? And also, at, we've got the levee bank and where the pipes come through to bring our water to our houses, who's going to be responsible for covering them up? Mm. Okay. Well, first of all, we'll get Craig to tell you about sandbags. Um, if you want to dial the 132 500 number, uh, they'll give you the closest unit and they'll come out probably not straight away to give you the sandbags and things like that. Um, so they can supply that. They'll actually mon uh, look at your house and see what you need. We're, we're not going to down and give you 500 sandbags. We're not going to be doing that. You'll get about 20 and they are to put across your doors, your vents, and use them especially around toilets and vents and things like that, um, uh, vents within your uh, properties. Because we know the flood water it can work its way back up, and that's the last thing you want is flooding from inside your properties. So that's why we're going down the line of your entrances and your vents on the outside and your toilets and vents inside. So with the... Uh, sorry? Access of sand. Access of sand. Um, we have been doing a lot with every council. I'm quite sure that the Wakery Council's down here. Um, they've got sandbags down here, and that's... Um, if you need sandbags and things like that, we can arrange that. So. Sorry. Yep. Yep. So. All right, so two-part question. Uh, the second part, I can't answer that. What you've done, paid rates and everything else. That is, I can't answer that. Yep. Yep. So I'll ask, answer the sandbag one. So if you're unable to fill sandbags and things like that, give the 132 500 number and we'll organise that to happen. Obviously, it'll be done at a convenient time for everybody because of if, you know, if 10 of you are wanting sandbags, we're not going to do 10 different trips, things like that. But the other side, of the, the monetary side, oh, I can't answer that part. Yeah. Look, um, regarding the Premier's comments around um, commitment to the houseboat industry, it wasn't just the houseboat industry. There is discussions as to what the tourism industry in general might be looking at. So, uh, 
Yeah, that's because unfortunately right now it's we haven't actually hit the disaster mode or anything else. So what is happening is in any situation like this, there needs to be an element of understanding what the true problem is and then actually designing the solution around the problem. So right now, part of what a whole lot of us are doing is collecting that information and trying to feed it back so that, that, that any a um, uh, solution that's put in place is actually going to help the people that need it the most. So we appreciate that it might feel slow for some and, and that is something that we really do, do apologise for but we do want to try and get this as right as possible. Thank you. Another question? Uh, this is just uh, to do with the power, is that right? Okay. Um, Rumour had it uh, a few days ago someone was saying they're panicking because they've heard that power is going to go out completely everywhere here in Wakeree for about three months. Now, I don't believe that's going to happen. Um, I believe it's just going to be the affected areas that will lose the power. So if you could just clarify so I can tell this person, please. Thank you. I think that's one for you, Paul. I think you hit the nail on the head at the start when you said I've heard a rumour uh, around the place. L like I said at the start of the presentation, the absolute desire is to keep the lights on for as many people as possible. The, the only time that we're going to disconnect is when it, there's a safety issue that starts to present itself to people. We've got a lot of people working in this area at the moment with a lot of the primary producers, a lot of the growers up here and, and those individuals that rely on pumping out of the river as well to keep their business alive and keep it, keep it going to make sure we can do everything to, to help them as much as we can. So the desire is to isolate where we can probably find a lot of low-lying shack areas are going to be impacted. There's no doubt about that, that you're going to be inundated and it's incumbent on us to disconnect so that nobody gets adversely impacted. Um, there's a lot of work being done in the, the head office at Adelaide and locally to make sure that we can achieve that at the moment. But if you're concerned and you're in one of those low-lying areas, we're happy for you to call us with the numbers that are on there. We're happy to assess what that looks like for you, if it's likely, if it's unlikely, if it's possible, if it's probable, uh, and we'd take you through that. But a lot of our people are here ready to scope these jobs to help you out through it. As long as I can get a cup of tea. Just a question for SHR. Just a moment, just a moment, please. Yeah, just a quick question, mate. Um, are you guys going to have on your website, like um, as you do your disconnections, a map of the things you have disconnected? Like obviously if you're in the affected area, you'll get a text message. But heaven forbid we have to do like a rescue or something. Can we look on like a website and see that that area has been isolated? Or um, obviously wait until you guys get there essentially. But if we had to, um, can we see oh, that whole floodplain has been isolated and we're free to... Go and make the rescue. That's a great question. Thanks. So at the moment, the outage map, I don't know how, how many of you are familiar with that. There's an outage map that we have of the state. Um, and normally when you look at it, depending on which area you're coming from, it's, it brings up the map of your local area. Um, under normal supply interruptions, there's a red dot normally and a, a polygon that shows you the area we think is impacted. You won't see that for this flood. What it'll look like is a planned piece of work. So you'll see a, a, an orange area that's a planned piece of work that shows the areas off and that it's been impacted by, by flood. The, red, the reason why we've turned off the, the unplanned outage stuff, uh, the red dots, is because it would keep pinging out SMS messages because it's automated to do that. When it looks like a piece of planned work with the power being off, then you'll be able to see that, yeah, that area has been impacted. Just a moment. Um, we're from Marook and we pump straight out of the river. I mean, yes, power, SA power will cut our power to our pump. 
what are we supposed to do for water um, uh, and who is going to supply decent drinking water and, and livable water for us in our little world. There's a, a group of about 12 houses that pump out of the river and we're all likely to lose our own domestic water. Um, you talk about a cup of tea, we won't even get a shower. So I'd just like to know who's going to supply us some decent water since they're keeping the supply to the town up. Okay. Thank you. Who would be best placed to take that? Oh. Uh, look, that's a really interesting question and one that most people um, who live in the region, Riverland and down in the lower areas also have to deal with. Um, most people will have settling tanks. We've been encouraging everybody to fill whatever tanks you have up. Um, what I'm trying to do is provide you with what the advice is so far that we're giving everybody because everybody has to make an assumption and decision based on their houses, okay? And we don't know what everybody's house looks like. Okay, so we're hoping that if you've got a settling tank that you can fill it up and keep it as full as possible so that if you do have a power outage, at least you will have some water um, to get you by. If you have, um, most people um, would have also have rainwater tanks. So please, um, you know, we've had a lot of rain, so hopefully they're full too. Um, and if they're not, they might not be connected to the house because we've had a lot of rain. Um, the reality is we're trying to work through that power and pump issue, which is what I said earlier. And that's one of the reasons why we're working closely with SA Power Networks to try and work out what the situation might look like. We're also trying to find where there are groups. And um, if there is no solution, then people may have to consider that as part of the decision-making process. As hard as what it is, I was in Murray Bridge last night, and oh, Monday night, and there is a group of brand new homes that are higher, that, that would be at the height of, of Wakery, and they are all on a move out notice because of power. Okay, so be mindful that this situation is across the entire corridor. It's not just here. So we will, we will do everything we can to work with SA Power Networks to keep pumps going. We have a commitment to try and do that. We are working really hard to try and work out where the pumps are, especially irrigation pumps. You turn off one irrigation pump and you potentially can have hundreds of acres out. So we are really, really mindful that this problem is big and we are, we are working towards trying to find a solution. Thanks, Barb. Now, do we have any other questions? Yes, just a moment. Uh, just for Donna, I think it was. Um, any view to dredging the channel that leads over to the second, the high water landing for the ferry? No. <laughs> Sorry, that sounded really rude. Um, no, look, that's certainly not something that's actually come up in any of our planning, but I will take a note and follow that up to see whether or not that is something that has been overlooked. Um, but, yeah, like I said, all, all I can do is table it um, at tomorrow's meeting and the other uh, areas, the marine area, uh, will hopefully be able to answer that question and it will be, you know, put with all the frequently answered questions just so that the whole community uh, gets the same answer. Hang on, I'll go to this gentleman. I think he's had up for a while and then it'll be over to the gentleman in the blue. Just along those lines of that dredging, it was brought up with you guys two months ago by me because uh, I live on the other side, and I've been pushing since 2016 to keep the trees out as we watch them grow, to keep the ground clear as it is basically a road, and most roads you don't let trees grow and reeds grow, which make the bank higher. The answers I was always given was 
There's little bugs that live in that bit of green on the beach edge, which means you can't dredge it out. But if you look on Google Maps and go back to the road view, you can see that the ground was looked after pre-2016, but I don't know what happened at that point. That's when everything started growing. Um, all the ferry people would know I brought it up with them quite regularly. I've discussed with multiple sections of the council and DIPTI since 2016 to keep it clear and open, and I've always received nothing in return. Um, that's your low point is where the reeds are, and back when it was initially brought up, you could have done it with a shovel. Um, there's a guy that's got a floating pontoon with a digger on it that would still be able to do it. Thank you. Donna, would you like to? No, again, I, I am unaware of what you're specifically um, talking about, so I will take that back to um, our team and try and get an understanding of whether it's an option um, and if it's not, why? And hopefully we'll be able to answer that question for you both. My question is to Donna as well and related to the ferry. It was reported in the media recently that the ferry would close when the flow rate got up to 100 gigalitres a day. Can you debunk that myth, please? And is there a point where the ferry will close if it gets up? Uh, David is talking about the council's preparing for 200 to 250 gigalitres a day. Is there a point where the ferry will need to close? got some more information here that could answer that more specifically uh, if you want to come see me after but the original information I had was for Taylorville Road um, not necessarily the ferry getting um, inundated or at risk as we call it so that is one of the issues we have not just with Wakery but with other ferries is the ferry themselves might be okay but it's the safety of getting the vehicles to the ferry to cross the river. So they are all the things we've been looking at. The information I originally had, um, and this may be out of date with the changes um, in the levels, um, and I apologise if it is, um, and happy to follow that up for you, but the information I had was that once we get to 140 gigalitres, then yes, Wakery Ferry may be at risk of having to close because of the road inundation. But we will try and keep the community abreast of any of those issues as they rise. Um, we are monitoring all of the detours that we've been working the last week and a half to put together. They are, um, I do have a, a copy of what, where they are currently, if you have any specific interest that you wanted to ask me. And again, we will continue to try and communicate where those detours are through Traffic SA. When they're activated, they will be listed and you can monitor that um, yourself if you have capability and internet. Um, thank you, Donna. I'd like to, that brings our meeting to a close and I would just like to thank um, our speakers, um, both up the front and those in the audience that have responded to questions. And I'd like to thank everybody who has asked questions and if we haven't been able to respond to them, hopefully they will be posted on the various agents' websites. Um, I would like to thank also the Bowling Club for hosting us tonight and preparing this. It, it has been very greatly appreciated, so thank you. And I'd really like to thank every community member who's actually made time to come out and you know um, hear information and work towards preparing your properties um, for this event. Look, we know it's challenging. We, we certainly do and, uh, and it's not a good time and we know that it's going to go on for quite a while. 
Um, but we do encourage you to prepare for this event, for your properties. But more importantly, and I think um, Craig mentioned it before, your own personal safety and your well-being, it, it really is our number one priority and that, that's what's most important. And I know it's going to be very difficult decisions you have to make, but please consider yourself first when you make your decisions about you know, how you're going to manage through this event. The speakers um, up in front of me have all agreed, oh, you know, they're, they're very kind, they're going to stay around while we um, pack up. So any questions that you do have, please feel free to come up and um, harass them. I mean, ask some questions. <laughs> Sorry, um, a bit of a slip there. Um, but again, thank you to the speakers and thank you to everybody for coming. Thank you.